Okay, the um, last video that I did, I had offered the series of things that I sent out to the dozen people that ordered it. And, um, you know, um, there were these five by seven prints that I made showing um, um, fine prints. That I want to give you as an example. There was this before and after um, unmasked and masked, so that you could see how this was opened up without losing the blacks when you did the masking. I also included a description of um, how I processed and how I shot it with the zones and stuff and the resulting graph that it made so that um, it would make sense how I came. And in the masking portion um, is demonstrated by making one print with the mask and one print without the mask. But then I also included this and this is a brief description of how to use this. And this, and I didn't mention this because I don't have that many of these. And um, but I make, I made this twenty-one step tablet, which is large enough to be easily measured on a transmission densitometer. And when you make a contact print, um, this print is easily measured with a reflection densitometer. And there are twenty-one steps. And um, it covers a density range of 1.65, which is what I determined to be um, the minimum density range or that you want, you want at least 1.65 in order to get white to black. And so when I make a print from that, a contact print, this is white. So I try to make this the same density as unexposed paper after it's processed. And I can just barely see step two. It's a little bit darker than that. Maybe only one point on the density timer. But that's what I'm looking for, just that one uh, step separate. And obviously it gets clearer. And then this is black. And then this is just a little lighter than that. Now this is, um, well, so this is what I use as my standard negative. And I thought I would talk about um, how to make a standard, how to use a standard negative. And in conjunction with this um, video lesson, <clears throat> I thought I would show you how to, to, to use a standard neg negative in a practical manner. And... Um, it was recommended to me that I try the FOMA paper from Eastern Europe. Um, not only did someone recommend, one of the people watching my videos recommend this, um, he was, but also I read a paper um, talking about Bruce Barbaum write, writing about this. So he said it's the, his, uh, the best paper he's ever used. So that convinced me to try it. So, um, I ordered that, and it took over a month to get here uh, to San Francisco. I had to order from New York, but New York had to wait a few weeks before they got it. <clears throat> um, I was told that um, it resembled the old Agfa paper, which is no longer. Now, my favorite paper of all time is Agfa Portriga. So I was really excited to get this paper and see if it was like Portriga. Now, um, the Portriga paper, um, I've had uh, on my wall, a print from on my wall for like 40 years now, and next to a paper, next to the Galleria paper, which is the Ilfrey Gallery paper. So I had a really good idea of how long Portriga, um, how stable it was compared to the Ilford Galleria paper after 36 years on my wall. 
um, I was able to take those out of the frame and measure it again. And in one of my videos, I actually show this. And I know for a fact that the, uh, the, the, the Ilford paper was not a multi-grade. Back then I used the gallery, it was a grade two paper. But I was able to achieve a 2.4 black after toning, which is a very good black. Now the Portrigo went to 2.5, and it didn't seem like, you know, it's 10 points more. So not a big difference, but it was a difference. So I, I wrote that down and I, I notated it on the back of the print. And um, after 35 years hanging it up in my bedroom, and as I moved from place to place, I would bring, but it's always been displayed. So I had indirect light, not directly in the window, but indirect light. After 36 years, I took it out of the frame and I measured it. 2.4 had... Uh, become 1.9 so even selenium toned it faded but it still looked good you can't really see that it's faded I mean you, the Dennis Tomer saw that but the Portriga went to 2.35 so it only faded um, a half a stop whereas the Ilford paper faded what one and two thirds stop yeah something like that um, so when I heard about this FOMA paper, I thought, well, maybe that paper's somehow made um, like the, the old Agfa Portriga. So I thought I would use this negative and do a series of tests and um, find out um, how different this FOMA paper was. Um, after all these initial tests, I had done on, no, no, unfortunately, the portrait is no longer available, so I couldn't test that. Um, but I tested it on the Ilford and the foam. Both are multi-grade uh, fiber-based paper. I tested it toned and untoned. And um, after I did these tests, I then selected three uh, negatives. I took um, a picture of El Capitan. I did... Uh, seagulls and wave and i did uh what's the third picture <laughs> i can't remember what i did and uh the third picture was seagull and wave capitan anyway I, I took three negatives that i had printed before and i reprinted it onto the foma paper and then after i washed it and dried it and toned it and everything I put it side by side and looked at um, the prints I had made on Ilford paper. And um, I would say that the Foma paper is a very good paper. Um, I'll say that right off the bat. Um, but this lesson is on how I used the standard negative to come up with um, my uh, results. Now, the first time I heard of using a standard negative um, was actually when I started learning color printing. In color printing, you've got um, a color negative that has three layers of emulsion, so it's even more critical to have a standard in color. Um, for many, many years in black and white, I never had a standard. I never, never heard of it. I never thought of it. I, never <laughs> I didn't start using a standard negative in black and white until I had decided to close my color lab and do black and white. Then one of the first things I did was I started making um, standards. So I had a baseline to know what um, papers could achieve. So what I do is I test this negative, just contact print, and um, uh, onto any paper that I try, the same developer, time temperature it's all the same but so the only thing that changes is the paper emulsion and I um, find out how fast the paper is how you know um, much contrast it has and so forth but in color um, the standard negative was for many years called a Shirley and the reason why that was was because Eastman Kodak um, chose an employee her name was Shirley and he must have shot over a million exposures uh, of her, and they would sell these negatives. And Shirley would be sitting, standing there with a, a gray card and a white half, white, half gray, 
and they would photograph her and shoot an ideal negative, um, a perfectly exposed negative, if you will. And they would sell it to clients and people would, and what we did as lab people, this was when I was a kid, every morning or every Monday for sure, you would print this negative on your emulsion. Now, assuming that your chemistry is well balanced, the temperature and the time is all accurate, right off the bat, you should get a good print. If it drifts, you correct the exposure, maybe you adjust the color density, and you you run with that. And customer negs are compared with the Shirley. So if the customer negative is darker than the Shirley, then you would increase exposure. If it was it needed more yellow, then you would accommodate that. And that was all done with the densitometer uh, initially. Uh, later on, they would have uh, video analyzers, which didn't work very well. <laughs> but um, you would test any different, because back then, if you had a 5-inch roll of paper, it would be, require a different exposure than your 10-inch paper and your sheet paper. And everything had to go through this surely, and you, you would balance everything so that no matter what you printed on, you would make a print that matched. This is the basic idea of a standard negative. Um, now, we'll talk a little bit about color here. Um, the reason why video analyzers and even densitometers didn't work that well um, and was better than nothing, comparing you could take a, a measurement of your customer negative, let's say the customer shot a gray card, you would compare it with the readings, the densitometer readings off of your Shirley and the gray card area. The, uh, um, and those numbers would tell you, oh, if your standard required 30 yellow and 30 magenta, this negative is going to require 40 yellow and 20 magenta because it's that different. And maybe one stop more exposure or 30% you know, less exposure. And that would give you your starting point. Um, this isn't done commonly, I guess, now. Uh, we did it all the time. Um, but even this doesn't work that well. Uh, it doesn't allow you to just make a straight print and run with it. It's, you, you make a test and you go, oh, it's too red or it's too yellow. And then you would have someone that was good at looking at color and make a correction and go back and maybe you'd print it or you'd test it again. Um, the reason why it didn't work, and I didn't know this until we developed our software, is because of the different slopes that film require. And a slope is when you print um, the gray to be perfect. If you had a gray scale like this, and this took 10 seconds, if you used 3 seconds, then this would go gray. If you use 25 seconds and this will go gray. Well, in color, what happens is when this is gray and you subtract one stop of exposure, this goes lighter, but it doesn't stay gray. It might go green. So therefore, when you cut 50% exposure, not only do you have to cut the time in half, but now you have to cut your magenta filtration to offset that green. Likewise, when you print this darker, this doesn't stay gray. The only negative that I ever used that did that well was a negative I made. And that was what our software did. That was what PS1 did. We made recommendations on how to make a negative from the transparency. We used the transparency grayscale. And we drew out these curves on a computer and it told you how to adjust the exposure so that you made a perfect neg. Um, the density range would be ideal and the grayscale would be ideal. When you had a perfect neg and you cut the exposure, then indeed that gray area, um, that lower step would remain gray. Even the blacks would remain gray. The whites would remain gray. Um, if anything, it would tweak maybe two points in an enlarger. The closest commercial film that did this well 
was the old VPS. And that was a later emulsion of the Veracolor Professional Short Exposure. VPS film did that well. Um, now, the, probably the best film is your natural color film by Kodak. Um, I don't know what you call it, but that, that, you know, if I do shoot color, that's the film I use. Um, films that exaggerate the color that is very, the slopes are very bad. So therefore, when you measure uh, the differences between your standard neg and your neg or your customer neg, that slope will throw your um, readings off and you can have offsets and that's what our PS analyzer did. I wrote a software that accommodated a slope and so forth as well as this. So, um, but working on that um, software uh, allowed me to finally make a perfectly color balanced color negative. And uh, it was not easy to do back in those days. We developed in the mid 80s, 1980s. But like I said, um, I never used a black and white nade as a standard in the darkroom until I uh, um, closed, decided to close the color lab and go back into black and white. And then I started investigating how I'm going to do this. And I had to learn how to make really good black and white nades from transparencies. And, and I started creating my own standard nade. So, um, I had decided that 1.65 density range was my ideal. And that's, you can look at video number two of 14, where I explain why I came up with that number. And this is printed so that you can see all 21 steps. So again, just see a difference, just seeing a difference between step 20 and 21, and a difference between two and one is what I shoot for. So it might be, and as a matter of fact, for the Ilford um, RC paper, multi-grain, I'm using 20 yellow to get this. But for the Ilford um, fiber-based paper, I'm using 60 yellow to get this, to get this look. Uh, the FOMA paper required zero filtration, zero yellow, zero magenta, and I was able to get that um, and then reason but this is basically a soft contrast as you can imagine to see all 21 steps is probably equivalent to grade one maybe even point five it's a it's it's not your number two um, when you want a maximum black to get this as black as the paper will go this black will no longer, um, you, you won't be able to see the, the difference between these two steps anymore. Because what will happen is, even though the densitometer may be able to detect a slight difference between these two steps, the human eye, this starts to merge. These three steps here start to merge. So um, even though I do this as a way to determine my, um, grade one, I don't really use this filtration for most of my negatives because I want a D-max on my print in the image. Which incidentally, for the Ilford paper, uh, the, the, for this particular uh, RC paper, it's about 10 magenta is what I use as a, for a number two grade. And I'm printing, when I make my proofs on RC paper, I'm about 10 magenta, 10, 12 magenta, okay? Um, but 20 yellow is what I used to make this, and this is what I record. So when I get a new emulsion from Ilford, because I buy like 195 feet of 44 inch paper, when I get a new roll in, I record the emulsion number, and I run this test, and then I, I have it. I, I can see that, oh, this paper used 60, this one's going to require 50 or whatever. Instead of, you know, 10 seconds, it's going to take 12 seconds. And that just tells me um, 
of course, this is with the same dilution, same time temperature to, of the developer I'm using. And that gives me an anchor so that when I go back and I pick a negative that I may have printed before on that emulsion, now I'm going to, instead of, you know, 10 magenta, I'm going to use 15 as my, as my beginning point. Of course, you use your eye to make the final judgment. But this gives you a... a a base to work from. And if I switch to foam up paper, then it's going to be totally different because the filtration is completely different. You compare 60 yellow with zero yellow, zero magenta. That's how big of a difference between Ilford and Foma is, okay? So this kind of information going from one type of film, uh, one type of uh, paper to another paper, is called translating. So I can translate from one paper to another. And the more you do this, the more it makes sense. Right now, if it's new to you, um, it, you know, it takes some math, but it's not rocket science. It's not hard math. It's just basic uh, math. <laughs> um, everything is done with the same light level. That's another thing. I have a light level meter, which I place on the easel. And when the darkness is totally dark, enlargers on I adjust the f-stop until the numeric value or what's the light falling on the easel is the same so I use that same light level all the time so that um, when I change from emulsion to emulsion I know I'm getting the same amount of light if I burn a light bulb it doesn't matter because I can adjust and you can even check your color temperature of your enlarger with, with filtration and so forth but I'm not going to get into that because um, I have to make a, a separate video for color um, how to tr how to tr convert densitometer readings to enlarger readings so that you have a basic starting point this would be really helpful for people who are printing C prints in the darkroom I don't know how they're doing it now but it might take them a mini test in order to get to the final color if they're not using a densitometer and a standard negative and an on easel meter. On easel meters, you can read red, green, blue lights and get a light level each separate um, reading through using scientific filters to block the sensor so that only red light gets through, only green and only blue. And then your dichroic filters will adjust to zero in each one of those and then you can maintain not only the correct light level for the darkness and the lightness of your print but for the color balance as well. Color analyzers are probably not sold anymore but back in the day they were $2,000 each and so um, but be that as may that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so again gaining your maximum black just to the point where it gets maximum black. That's what constitutes my normal, okay? So when the black creeps up to here, it's too much. I don't need that. I just get this black so that no matter any more exposure, no, no matter how much more exposure I give it, it doesn't get any darker. You stop at that point. And this might be just, this might read 2.1. This might read 2.209, see? Um, Incidentally, one of the things I found out is just talking about fiber paper, the Ilford multi-grade paper gave me about 2.1 to 2.12 black. That was the maximum black, untoned. Um, the FOMA paper gave me about 1.99 2.0 sometimes about 2.0 so the Ilford paper does get blacker which is important to me okay also the white um, this was a little whiter the, the Ilford paper was a little bit whiter point, 0, 0.01 0.02 points whiter than the FOMA paper so the FOMA paper it really is a softer looking print the blacks aren't as deep the whites aren't quite as white it's it's less snappy but it has um, an old um, look to it. 
it does in that way it does look like the old papers not only the old Agfa paper the old Kodak papers as well they were a softer white um, I believe that the Ilford people they put optical brighteners well I know they put optical brighteners in their papers to get it whiter to, to, to look whiter I don't think Ophoma is doing that but I don't know I'm not sure um, so again using a standard using the same negative on different papers gives you an apples to apples comparison you can know that this paper takes 10 seconds and this paper takes 16 seconds in order to get the same and um, the maximum black um, what your normal filtration what your normal filter should be to get a grade zero versus a grade two one three you can do all that if you don't have a standard then you're just trying it but if you do this and you write it down then you have it um, so that's how you use standard now um, selenium toning increases the black by about 0.15 so if you're starting with um, 2.1 you're gonna get 2.25 2.3 uh, after toning if you're starting with 2.0, you're only gonna get 2.15 with toning. Um, and that's what I found out with this test. Now, the main difference that I discovered between the FOMA paper and the Ilford paper is that the FOMA paper is strictly orthochromatic. What that means is you have to handle it only under red light. Um, this is different from most black and white papers because most black and white papers you can handle it under an OC filter which is an amber light in my dark room I, I use mostly red light because that's um, it works for both lithofilm as well as papers because Ilford paper is doesn't see red light either so you can safely handle Ilford um, black and white paper under red light but I do have one OC filter which I turn on that's about eight feet from my processing tray and the OC filter what it does is it gives you the opportunity to look at the image as it develops out and you can see when it's dark enough the red light is not good for that you you don't um get a good idea of the con everything in red light looks contrasty so it's hard to judge contrast when you're under red light it's hard to tell if the high values are just dark enough so you don't want to process by inspection under red light as a matter of fact the OC filter was developed for this purpose and when you're printing commercially um, it's very helpful to be able to just you know this 45 seconds with this print you know one minute, oh, it's, it's not dark enough to leave it in for another minute. Okay, though, and you can even take hot developer and, and you know, this is how, this is where this came. That was all done under OC filters, um, where you can see all these steps better than under red light. You don't see all these steps. You see in black, you know, it's like, okay. But what that means is the FOMA paper is much more sensitive to exposure because if this is, if this is the light spectrum that we see, red light is this narrow. If you increase the OC filter, um, which is amber, brownish, if you will, is this wide. So Ilford paper doesn't see that because Ilford paper is not sensitive to and Kodak paper and Fuji and Oriental and all those papers uh, don't see this that's why you can use this safe light and handle their, their paper but if you're going to use FOMA paper this is going to fog your paper so you have to only um, use red light to handle it in the dark in a, in a dark room but that means that 
that paper is sensitive to this and it sees more of the spectrum. So as a consequence, FOMA paper is much more sensitive to exposure. Um, to give you an example, um, when I did this with 60, 60 yellow for the Ilford paper, I used 18 seconds with a given light level, 2.2 on my meter. The FOMA paper only took like seven seconds <laughs> with the same light level. Different filtration, but the same light level. So the FOMA paper is much, uh, requires a much shorter exposing time. And this is really beneficial for those people that want a short exposure time because if you're using a long exposure time, the heat from the enlarger could buckle the film. Once that happens, your image goes out of focus. So people um, like short exposure times so that um, they don't have to use glass. It's not an issue for me because I print everything with glass. Glass, of course, gives you more dust. There's some more spotting on your print. But glass will hold the negative perfectly flat. Even if you use a short exposure time, film doesn't lay flat. So you have a slight difference between focusing on the corner and the center of the print. So Richard, my good friend Richard Poltowski, taught me years ago, always use glass because you want corner to corner sharpness. Not only that, but he uses a zig align system to align the negative stage, the lens, and the easel stage so that um, everything is perfectly aligned. Um, that's, a, that's a system where you have mirrors, top and bottom, from the lens to the easel with LED lights in the corner that reflects back and forth. Those lights get smaller and smaller as it reflects and it creates an X as they intersect. If that X starts bending, then you know that your enlarger is out of alignment. So Richard uses a zig align to enlarge, align all my enlargers, all the enlargers in the lab that I have and the one I, I currently use. And if you don't use glass, you're not taking full benefit of that alignment system. So Richard taught me to always use glass. Now, you've got four more surfaces to clean when you have glass. So you have to be good at spotting. And you can't um, get away without any spotting. Especially when you're making 20 by 24 or 60 by 20 prints. You're going to have dust. And you just get used to that. That's part of printmaking, spotting, good spotting technique. Um, of course, because I do masking, I'm required to use um, glass for most of my printing anyway, because most of the stuff I do, if it's worth printing, it's worth masking. So, um, okay. So, another thing about FOMA paper is because it is more sensitive to yellow light, any yellow light in the enlarging system um, is going to expose the paper. Uh, and so when you're burning, when you're burning down high value, high light detail, the foam of paper is going to respond very well to that, um, easily to that. Now I have to get some prints to show you what that means. I should have had this out already. So I have all these <laughs> I enjoy doing this so it's not it's not um, that much work. But here is Ilford with 60 yellow, okay? So I can see, and this, this measures 0.04, this part of the air. That step measures 0.04. This is 0 0.06, 0 0.09, 14. 
this is uh, 2.09 so almost 2.1 untoned the foma and this is 21 and a half seconds okay uh, this is zero yellow zero magenta it's only 5.5 seconds so one-fourth the exposing time is this is very convenient to use this this measured 0.05 this measured 0.07 so already I'm seeing a little bit and I, when I look at it I can't tell it was a densitometer that told me that this is a little bit darker than this 0.07 10, 13, 17, 22. This is 1.97. Okay. But again, that's not your maximum black. You can get, you can get a little bit darker. Um, when I went to, I think 10 magenta or that's another thing. It's very sensitive to, um, changes in filtration. Don't forget I'm using a dichroic filter, uh, head so I can dial in minute amounts of magenta and yellow. Oh, incidentally, a multi-grade, you probably do know this, but a multi-grade paper has two layers of emulsion. In, in one layer is sensitive to green. So in order to, one layer is sensitive to green, the other one is sensitive to blue. So in order to expose the blue layer more, you would decrease yellow and more blue light would go through the emulsion in order to affect the green layer you would use a magenta filter so using magenta and yellow gives you different contrast because the blue layer blue sensitized layer is a high contrast emulsion and the green uh, emulsion layer is a low contrast okay now what I did here with a FOMA okay this is um, I don't know if you can see this, but I I just basically covered this with a cardboard, and I gave thirty three percent more. So after five point five seconds, I gave one point nine seconds and exposed this area, and you can see that 0 0.07 became 0 0.09. But these steps are very soft and easily seen. And that's so, so this paper is really nice when you don't mind losing your whites. Um, in order to check, you'd have to take unexposed paper and put it right next to it and see that, oh yeah, that's a little darker than the unexposed section. But this is um, easily done with the foam. And that's because it's seeing a wider spectrum of light. You'd have to cut all the yellow out in order to not affect um, because the paper is already yellow sensitive is already amber sensitive okay uh, whereas when i went to the ilford paper and okay this is not this one <laughs> this one I did this, and this is, you can kind of kind of see this. I, I covered this. From 0.05, it went to 0.07. So this is not as soft as this. The whites are, are whiter than this. This is the main difference between the two papers. Um, you can simulate this with the for paper, and I did that with this one. This one is actually uh, my normal. Oh, this is with when I, when you add yellow to the burning. So you make it with one one um, filter pack, and then you add yellow, and then you burn, and then you can go into the high values and soften it, um, similar to the foma paper. Okay. Um, yeah, not. There's a lot of tests here. The reason why is because I tested other things besides just the contrast and exposure of the paper. I tested toning, okay? Um, I made this. 
and these this is Ilford paper this is Foma paper and I mount it on a cardboard and I put it in the window facing the sunlight and I measure these things before I put them in the window and I measured it after one and after two weeks it's been in the window for two weeks now so now I have some fading data to, to tell you you may think that 0.1 is not much in terms of black but the reason why Maximum D max is important to me because I want my prints to last a long time. It's not a good idea, obviously, to put your prints in a window facing the sun every day, but um, it accelerates the fading. Um, to give you an idea, um, I have this one. <laughs> this has been the window for a year and eight months. So, to give you an idea, the multi-grade fiber paste paper toned started in June 20th of 2016 at 2.34 black. One year later, it measured 1.97. The whites didn't change nearly as much, but the blacks, you can see. And here it is, this, uh, October of this year, it went to 1.82. So now it's less than what it took um, 36 years on, on a bedroom wall. So I could safely say that one year in the window is equivalent to about 30, 40 years on your bedroom wall. Um, so that's what a standard negative can do for you. It can give you this kind of information. Now, let's go to this. Like I said, it may not make, may not seem like a big deal, uh, point 0.1 black, but when you compare the, the Ilford paper with the Foma paper. My D-Max, the blackest black I got untoned on the Ilford paper was 2.09, about 2.1. Here I got 2.11 when I used 40 magenta. Um, the Foma paper untoned the uh, D-Max I got was, where is it? <laughs> Actually, this is all toned. Well, untoned is 1.95, yeah, untoned. But when I tone it, I was able to get 2.2, 2.16 here, 2.15. 2.13 so I can almost I can get 2.2 um, almost but when I tone the Ilford paper went to 2.3 okay now from 2.3 in two weeks that became 2.2 so I lost 10 points in just two weeks. Whereas toned, it went from here, 2.2 to 2.15 and 2.14. Lost six points here. This one lost five points. This one lost over 10 points, 2.19 to 2.07. So all those strips are giving me, it's not um, conclusive, but it gives you a, a range of readings so you can make a general um, assumption that you're gonna lose about, two point, about 0.1, a third of a stop in just two weeks. In both 
the FOMA as well as the Ilford paper. Now, I mentioned that um, I like the Portrigo because for some reason, in 36 years, it only faded half a stop. 2.35, that's darker than new stuff I'm printing now. You know, it's, I'll get it. I should have had this <clears throat> with me. This is the Portriga. I also like the way it tones. It's got this really nice brown tone. It's not real brown. But this, okay, what I, but I have to admit, when I made this print in the early 80s, I intentionally darkened these areas to get the figure of the tree to come out. So this is really black um, due to my mask the way I masked it because I wanted to isolate this but that was a 2.5 and that was a 2.35 I did this on the Ilford Galleria paper number two paper and these are contact prints and I made a separate um, litho sheet that exposed only these these black so these borders are D max it's as black as the paper will go and I wanted to get D max in the print as well so these are also uh, and it measured 2.4 now it's only 1.90 but it still looks really good um, but this, these are the two prints and so I wanted to know if the FOMA paper was as good as this in terms of lasting uh, quality. If, if, if it would fade less. Now, all Agfa paper wasn't like that. The Brovera wasn't like that. The, Bro, the Agfa Brovera paper didn't respond like the Portriga. So I never really was a big fan of Brovera. But it might be that when my contact told me that the FOMA paper was like the old Agfa paper. Maybe he's talking about the Brovera paper. Um, which, if I remember right, was a softer paper. So, I thought, well, maybe it's due to processing. You see, um, I read that when you process films and paper longer, what happens is the developer seeps into the emulsion and develops out the darker, the deeper areas of the emulsion and gives you a better black. Now, even though I process for four minutes and it develops deeper, it's not gonna get any blacker on a print. But because it's deeper, it may be able to last longer. That was the idea. So I was fairly convinced that that's what it was. I couldn't believe that Agfa somehow developed a paper that would not fade. <laughs> and uh, Ilford didn't know how to do it and Kodak didn't know how to do it because I've done these tests for many years. I started doing these window tests back in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. I, I, you know, I used to do this. I lived in Pacifica, so I put it in the window facing the sun. And same as this is Pacifica, by the way. So um, I thought, well, maybe it wasn't the manufacturer's trade secret of how they made paper it had more to do with because I happened to have processed this longer because I don't remember I generally practice process anywhere from two to two and a half minutes and maybe I did this for four minutes that's what I was thinking so I did that with this some of these are what two minutes some of these are three some of these are four minutes and guess what it didn't make a difference <laughs> so that's not it um, I also toned some for four minutes, two minutes, one minute, three minutes. That didn't make a difference. They all um, faded the same amount no matter how it was toned. 
Now, obviously, certain papers, when you tone it longer, it changes color. Um, but the FOMA did not change color. It just didn't show that much difference. Um, uh, this is selenium toning, by the way. So this is what you can do with a standard negative. You can test these things out. Um, but what that means is I actually get um, in two weeks time on the Ilford paper that's faded it actually looks better than the FOMA paper when it was brand new now what's that equal to one year in the window I won't know until I keep this up for one year but it tells and that's another thing this tells me that whatever uh, was toned um, lasts longer than untoned and any any of these gray seals that started darker remain darker even if it took two years of fading whatever um, was um, oh, the D max, it 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 always was consistent. Uh, the lighter blacks faded more than the deeper blacks. So, if you want your prints to match, and that's what I'm doing, I'm I'm making prints that I want to last like a thousand years. I don't know, it's, you know, I'm not gonna be here obviously, but if it falls in the right hands, people look and say, "Oh yeah, look at this. This is." How it used to be here and whatever. So I actually tested um, deviations in processing to see if it would fade less. And what I found out was no, it doesn't. But anyway, this is an example of how to use a standard negative um, testing new emotions finding the contrast range, knowing the speed of the paper, toning differences, um, basic exposure information, whether it's soft like um, the FOMA or harder like uh, the Ilford paper, and you can equate it with previous emulsion so you can do this translation going from paper to paper so that if you wanted to print this negative, and you didn't have this paper in it, but you have this paper, you can translate and you'll be that much closer on your first test. Um, if you're going to use a densitometer in conjunction with a standard negative, um, you, need a light, you need a light meter. You need something on, um, like, I don't have it here, but, you, you know, we have this meter where you press a button, turns on for like 45 seconds. It gives you a numeric readout depending on how much light falls on it. You turn your f-stop until you get the number you want, and then you're, <clears throat> you, you're the same, you've got the same light levels you had last week, last year, you know. And if you're making an eight by 10, <clears throat> you can do that. You take the, take the negative out after you focus it and everything, take it out, close the enlarger, take a light level reading, so it's 2.3. Put it back in, you make your print. If you want to make a 16 by 20, you enlarge it, turn your light, uh, take it out, increase the uh, f-stop until you get 2.3 again, and you use the same time, and it'll match. Um, it's a benefit of a on easel. Another thing is you can measure 2.2, um, and you, you can lock your, your um, lens at f8, at 2.2, you raise your uh, enlarger until it gives you that, and then you close one stop, and you see what that meter. Now the meters should be calibrated to 0.3 equals one stop, but these are homemade by us, so they're not t totally linear. So instead of instead of 2.2, when you increase your f-stop to f uh, 5.6, you might get 2.4. Um, that's one stop. You close it, you might get. Uh, 1.85 or 1.9 and then you know that's one stop away and so you can use those deviations from 2.2 .2 to 
to know what one stop is or two stops. Increase your time accordingly and then you have your your basic um, working scale to work from when you're, when you're printing other negatives. So if you do have a densitometer, you can use any one of these steps. Uh, you know how light that is. That's step number eight. You measure step number eight on this negative, you get a densitometer reading. You measure your negative. If you know that you want that table to be this dark, you know precisely how to adjust the exposure that this negative took to make this negative where that table is going to be exactly that dark. As simple as that. Obviously, you got to look at the range and there's all that, but um, densitometer in conjunction with an on-easel meter and a standard negative gives you all this to work with. And that's why I included it with this packet when I sent out to um, the 12 people who ordered my print. Hopefully they'll be able to use it. And um, yeah. So the conclusion after all this is this paper is just that good. <laughs> it doesn't seem to fade. And I don't know how Agfa made the paper. They probably won't tell. But it'd be great if they made it again because it, it, it is just that good. Um, standard negative. Um, yeah. Can't recommend it highly enough. You can make your own standard negative. Um, let me get a reflection piece I'll show you. Um, I don't know if they still sell these, but this is an excellent piece. Excellent tool. It's kind of dirty now. But this is a Macbeth color checker. So... This is what I used to make my standard negative in color. Um, I was able to make this gray, 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 just by exposure. By cutting my exposure, this would go to this density. By increasing exposure, this would go to this density and remain gray, okay, in color. Um, <clears throat> when I used this as my standard color negative, if I want a decent skin tone, I could take the densitometer readings off of the negative that produced th this patch, whatever that reading was, I'd measure the skin tone of a customer negative, compare it to this, and say, oh, adjust it by this much, and then make your first test. And the skin tone of this negative would be close to this. If I wanted, um, and mostly I would use, use gray. But this is for skin tone, for gray. You know, there's a lot of things that are gray. Sidewalks, you know, um, coffee maker, uh, you know. You, you have all those measurements on your standard negative. You just measure those different areas. And you have all that you compare with an unknown negative. The main problem isn't finding something in the, your customer negative that would be white or gray or light gray or dark gray. That wasn't the problem with slope. <laughs> Most color negatives are not balanced. They're not made to be balanced. I don't know why that is, but the only one came close to it was Kodak with their v, old VPS. That was a very, very good film. Um, it seems like People went to saturated colors and they gave up the grayscale in order to go for saturated colors. That seems to be what happened. But anyway, that's my lesson on the standard negative and why I included it. And I would recommend that all of you shoot your own standard negative. Now, obviously, getting a 21 steps is not easy. This, <clears throat> this wasn't easy to make, but and I didn't have that many. That's why I didn't 
when all, I was afraid I was gonna get like a hundred orders and I have to make a hundred prints times four, and I didn't want to have a hundred of these, so I didn't include it. But since there was only twelve, I sent it out to those twelve. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now I. I'll think about doing a similar lesson strictly in color and give you the math, um, how to do slope and, and all that stuff. But we, I actually wrote a PS analyzer, which we never sold. It was just written for my lab. And uh, that's what I used. I would say, okay, this room one printed with this filtration, and what's this room five look like? And it would translate and say, okay, print in room five and use this filter pack and this exposure for room five. Oh, room five has different emulsion. What does that mean? It would translate not only that, but it would translate the difference between these two emulsions. And so it's just simple math. It's long, but it's, you know, and that's what our analyzer did besides taking measurements from the standard day and comparing it to a customer day and doing that as well. It was actually the one software we used the most was the analyzer. And we never sold any of those, but um, it was the best in, in hindsight. The, the PS1 was very important because you had to have good negatives. Um, but we didn't use it every day because once you get a balance and you're, you've got until then your chemistry, chemistry shifts or you get a new intranegative emulsion. Right? Uh, and then we had the QC program, which is for balancing chemicals, which you do on a daily basis, but nothing was used more than the analyzer, because we had like I don't know, ten dark rooms, and you know, okay, standard negative, make your own, and uh, get an on easel meter. If you can't find one, you should email me. Um, I have some here, actually. I could I could send it out to you and um, get a densitometer if you can. They're very they're, they're, you know you can get them for a song now. Okay, until next time. That's the lesson on the standard negative. Okay.